Welcome back again. Remember last time we ended with the beginning of the fabulous 18th dynasty? We talked about how good times were coming to Egypt, but the important thing to stress about this beginning is that women are powerful. This is where we get in Egypt woman power, where they become very important. Now, we ended with the death of Tutmosis I, who was the first king to be buried in the Valley of the Kings. A powerful pharaoh, but when he dies, he leaves only one child who is purely royal. Now, what I mean by purely royal, if you'll remember, there are three relationships that a woman can have to the pharaoh. She can be the great wife. Now, that is the top of the line. She is the chief wife of the king. There is only one great wife at any one time, and that's as good as it gets. But beneath the great wife, there are other wives. Women who are married to the king, who have full rights, their children can perhaps sometimes become king. And beneath them are concubines. These are not just hangers-on. One shouldn't think of that at all. Um, under rare circumstances, the son of a concubine could become pharaoh. These were women who were a significant part of the palace, but certainly beneath the wives. Now, when Tutmosis I died, there was only one child of the great wife alive, a 12-year-old girl named Hatshepsut. So she is the only one who, in a sense, is pure royal. Both mother and father are king and queen. And the question becomes, who will be king? Right? Who will be king? Now, if you remember, there's an heiress theory, the theory that it's matrilineal. You become king by marrying the woman with the pure royal blood flowing through her veins. And that's what happens. Whoever marries Hatshepsut, this little 12-year-old girl, will become king of Egypt. Now, Tutmosis I had a son by another wife, whose name is Tutmosis, and he becomes Tutmosis II by marrying Hatshepsut. He's perhaps in his early 20s, she's 12 years old, and they are married, and he becomes king of Egypt. They're married for 20 years, 20 years. They have a daughter, Neferu Re. And as far as we can tell, it's an uneventful marriage. He doesn't raise any great obelisks, doesn't build any incredible monuments. And we have his mummy. He wasn't a particularly attractive man either. It may have been a long 20 years for Hatshepsut. And I'll, I'll suggest why I say that later. But he dies. And now Hatshepsut, the great wife, right? is a widow who will become king. Well, there's a contender. There's no son with pure royal blood. She doesn't have a son, Hatshepsut. But her husband did have a son by another woman, but not the great wife, of course. This is Tutmosis III. Now, think about the relationship between Hatshepsut and Tutmosis III, right? Now remember, her husband had been her half-brother, right? So what is the relationship between Hatshepsut and this boy, Tutmosis III? Well, one relationship is he's her stepson, right? Because this is the child of her husband by another woman, so it's a stepson. But also, since her husband was her half-brother, it's a nephew. So it's a little bit complex, but that's the way things were in ancient Egypt. So we have this young boy who is the contender for the throne. And he's going to be king. He's going to be one of the greatest kings Egypt has ever seen. Just not right now. Hatshepsut becomes regent. The boy is too young. He's maybe six, seven years old. And she is regent in his place ruling Egypt, right? This is, again, a powerful woman. She is ruling Egypt. She, at some point, is going to make a decision 
that has never been made in Egypt before. And let me present it in terms of describing a monument she builds. Right? She builds a monument that is, many people feel, many people feel, the most beautiful temple in Egypt. Right? It is a spectacular thing. She decides to build at Deir el Bahari. Remember, the, called the place of the northern monastery. Deir means monastery. Bahari means northern, because it's, bar is Arabic for sea, so it's northward, seaward, towards the Mediterranean. That's north. And this was called the place of the northern monastery because there was once a Coptic monastery there. So the locals called it that. It's an Arabic name. She calls her temple Jesher Jesheru, sacred of sacred places. And she chooses Deir al-Bahri for one reason and one reason alone, I think. This is where Mantuhotep I built his mortuary temple. And he was the great unifier of Egypt, and she is saying, I'm really like him. So she puts her temple right next to his, similar architecture even, similar architecture. The temple tells the story of her reign. If we look on the walls, we will see what she was most proud of during her reign. But first, the mystery of the temple. When Champollion, the decipherer of hieroglyphs, first visited this temple, 1829, he had just cracked the code, he could read hieroglyphs. He wanted to get as many texts as he could. He was copying hieroglyphs, copying hieroglyphs, and he had been through, the, through Egypt quite a bit. And he came to Deir al-Bahri, and looked at this temple, and he went into a, a back chamber, and he looked on the wall, and he couldn't figure out what was going on. He could not figure out what was going on. There was a scene of two kings together. Now, one king, he knew from his previous writings, when he, when he had copied inscriptions, he knew who this king was, Tutmosis III, a great king. He knew he was a great king. He knew about his military exploits. This was a great king. Then there was a second king, King Hatshepsut didn't quite understand anything about this king. A king, no doubt, was a king, wearing a false beard of authority, wearing the kilt of the pharaoh. This was a king. But what he couldn't figure out was why was this king in front of the great king? In other words, this Tutmos III, about whom he knew everything, was sort of taking a second place behind this other king. Couldn't figure it out. He also couldn't figure out the grammar associated with these pictures, the hieroglyphic inscriptions, because sometimes the king was called Her Majesty. Right? Why not His Majesty? Very curious. He never figured it out. Never figured it out. It wasn't until a later Egyptologist, Lapsius, in the 1850s, who figured out that at some point in her reign, Hatshepsut declared herself king. She had ruled as queen, and then at some point she said, I'm king. And she started wearing the false beard of authority. The pharaoh's beards that you see in statues and paintings are not real beards. Egyptians were clean-shaven. And she tied the beard on with chin straps. And if you look carefully at Egyptian statues of pharaohs with beards, you will see on the sides of the cheeks indentations that indicate the strap holding the beard. So Hatshepsut declares herself king. And she builds this fantastic monument, Deir al-Bahri, as we call it, her mortuary temple, where she could be worshipped. And on the temple, she tells the story of her life. But there's a problem on the temple walls. If you look for Hatshepsut's name, you're not going to find it. It's been carved out. Everywhere that Hatshepsut put her name, it's been erased. And the name has been replaced with three different names. Sometimes you'll see Tutmosis I, her father. Sometimes you'll see Tutmosis II, her husband. And sometimes you'll see Tutmosis III, the nephew, stepson, who will become king of Egypt. For a long time, Egyptologists didn't know how this happened or why. But we'll get to that. On the walls of this temple, you will see what she is most proud of. First. She sent a trading expedition to the land of Punt. P-U-N-T is how we transliterate it from the hieroglyphs. It was also called the God's Land. We're not exactly sure where it was. The best bet 
is modern Eritrea, which is near Ethiopia. The way we figure out where it was is by what they're bringing back on this expedition. They bring back giraffes, animal skins, exotic animal skins, ivory, frankincense and myrrh. So it's a good bet it was there. It was quite a thing to send an expedition to punt, let me tell you. You first had to march across the Wadi Hamamat, this ancient caravan road that went from outside of Thebes to the Red Sea. And then you would sail south along the Red Sea. And remember, Egyptians weren't great sailors. They were spoiled by that easy river sailing. They weren't good navigators. So they hugged the coast. They would hug the coast. And they would go about 40 miles in one day, anchor at a cove, go another 40 miles, and do that for 15 days, 600 miles. Big deal to send an expedition there. Quite bold, quite bold. And Hatshepsut it was. On the walls of the temple, we see this expedition. And what's really wonderful, you get wonderful, wonderful details of what the people were like and what the expedition was like. We see the Queen of Punt greeting the expedition. Now, Hatshepsut didn't go. She sent the expedition. But the Queen of Punt is shown as being almost morbidly obese. She, she has elephantiasis, and so does her daughter. So you get this immense woman greeting the expedition. But we also see the houses of the people who live there, and their thatched roofs on stilts. This is the first accurate representation of sub-Saharan Africa in history. It's the first time anybody had ever come back and recorded what's there. And we also see, I mean, Hatshepsut was a, a smart cookie. We also see what they're bringing back. And as I say, they bring back things like giraffes. Hatshepsut started the first zoo. First zoo was Hatshepsut's. So they're bringing back exotic animals, baboons, and things like that. They're bringing back piles of incense. We see it piled up on the decks of the ships. But we also see a great detail. This is why I say she's really smart. They're not just bringing back the frankincense and myrrh. They're bringing back the incense trees themselves. And you can actually see the trees being carried by the men, and the roots are protected by baskets. So these people knew their botany. And she is going to plant the trees in Thebes. As a matter of fact, on the wall of the temple, she even says, I made for my father Amun a punt in Thebes, meaning she had the frankincense and myrrh growing there. So it must have been quite something. But this is her expedition to punt. Another thing that she puts on this temple wall, and this is really an autobiography. It tells it all. And it tells it from birth. She talks about her divine birth. Now remember, pharaohs were always called sa Re, son of Re. They are the son of the sun god. Well, she could call herself the daughter of Re, I guess, but she doesn't. She tells another story. And it's right on the walls for all to see. The god Amun, disguised as her father, Tutmosis I, visits her mother. Right? And the result of this nocturnal visit is that the mother is pregnant from Amun with Hatshepsut. So Hatshepsut's father is really the god Amun, is what she's saying. So she is divine, just like the pharaohs. A very, very, very cute little detail that, that the, the sculptors got it wrong on the, on, the, on the temple wall. Usually when a pharaoh told his, his story of his divine birth, they show the pharaoh and his soul, his ka, being created on a potter's wheel. The myth was that the god Hanum, a ram-headed god, who was a potter, creates everybody out of clay on a potter's wheel. And it's kind of neat because, you know, it's, it's the same as in the Bible. In the Old Testament, Adam, if you remember. Adam means clay in, in Hebrew. And it, and it kind of is a similarity. But anyway, Hanum is always shown creating the ka of the king, and the king himself, little, two little doubles on a potter's wheel. And it's a standard scene. So what they must have said to the artist, they say, oh, we want the uh, birth scene, you know, the divine, divine birth scene. So we have Hatshepsut that's being created. She's on a little potter wheel. You have two little figures, but they're both little boys. <laughs> you can see they're naked. You know, they should have had little girls for Hatshepsut, but they, they kind of just copied the old scene. But it didn't bother her. She didn't change it. Didn't change it. Left it as it was. Another thing that she was very proud of was quarrying obelisks. Hatshepsut actually erected four obelisks at Karnak Temple, the great temple of Egypt on the east bank of Thebes. And on the walls of the temple are just about the only scene we have 
of how they transported the obelisks. It's a remarkable scene. It shows the two obelisks on a barge, end to end. She, she, apparently, they put the, the two obelisks. Now, the obelisks are huge. You know, they're 90 feet high. 90 feet high. They weigh something like a quarter of, you know, 250,000 tons. Right? They're huge. And they're end to end on a single barge. They were quarried at Aswan in the south of Egypt and towed by 27 boats. And you can see the boats in the Nile with ropes attached to this barge. There are three pilot ships that are guiding them. And she was very proud of this. And she says that they were quarried and erected in seven months. Right? So the whole thing, start to finish, was seven months. And to this day, if you want to see the tallest obelisk still standing in Egypt, go to Karnak Temple and you'll see Hatshepsut's obelisk. So she was very proud of these things, very proud, and, and rightly so. All indications are that during her reign, there was tremendous prosperity. Tremendous. And she wasn't masquerading as a man. One shouldn't think that. No, she was clearly saying, I'm a woman, but I'm king of Egypt. At the base of her obelisk, she even calls herself the female falcon. Remember, the pharaoh was always associated with Horus, the falcon god, and she is the female falcon. So she's not masquerading. Now, she has two tombs. Why would a person have two tombs? Well, one was as queen of Egypt. Remember, she was queen of Egypt for a while. But that wouldn't do. She built a tomb, queen of Egypt, sarcophagus in it, but abandoned it. She was going to be buried in the Valley of the Kings. And that's where her tomb is, in the Valley of the Kings. It's one of the longest tombs in the valley and one of the most dangerous. It was a very difficult excavation by Howard Carter. Um, it was, had been filled in with rubble by, by rain. You know, when rains come, the rare rain in the Valley of the Kings causes boulders and rocks to come cascading into tombs that are open. And this had been packed for hundreds and hundreds of years. When he finally reached the burial chamber, it was a terribly damaged tomb, but there were two sarcophagi there. Two. And they're interesting sarcophagi. They're in the shape of a cartouche. Right? They're royal. One was, of course, for Hatshepsut, but the other was her father's. She had decided that her father would be buried with her. And I think it's significant. She didn't pick her husband. We don't have a sarcophagus for Tutmosis too. And during her entire reign when she's ruling as king, never mentions her husband once never mentioned she was married to the previous pharaoh. He's never mentioned. That's why I say I think it might have been a long, long 20 years married to him. But she have, has this sarcophagus for herself and another one for Tutmosis I, her father. She has another monument that's quite interesting. It's called the Chapelle Rouge. The reason we call it in French is because the French excavated it. It's the Red Chapel. It's made out of Aswan granite. It's rather nice. It's red, it's red. And what's interesting is this. In this little chapel that was erected at Karnak Temple, she shows herself side by side with Thutmosis III. The two kings, the two royal people are standing next to each other. Now this is important, very important. Many people wonder, did Hatshepsut usurp the throne from her nephew's stepson? Did she somehow push him in the background maybe imprison him, who knows what, because she wanted to keep the power in her own hands, because he's growing up, time is passing, he's ready to become king, and we don't hear from him. We don't. Many, many people feel this was a kind of power play, Hatshepsut won, and when she finally died, Tutmosis appears, becomes a great king, as I said, but that's for next time, becomes a great king, but out of anger, as soon as he's pharaoh in his own right, erases her name from dear old Bahari and replaces it with the names of his ancestors, right? Tutmosis I, Tutmosis II is his father, right? We've got grandpa, we've got dad, and we've got me, Tutmosis III. So he's really showing I'm the legitimate king from one to two to Tutmosis III. So many people feel, many, that this was done in anger. And the reason I say this Chapelle Rouge, Red Chapel is so important. 
it shows that it's not the case. He didn't do it out of anger. Here's why I say that. The Red Chapel was later dismantled, well into Tutmosis' reign, I mean, way into his reign. It had always been standing in Karnak, and her name, Hatshepsut's name, had been allowed to remain on that chapel. It was only erased like 20 years after Tutmosis III became king. He didn't do it right away. And the question then becomes, well, why did he wait? If, he, if, he, if it wasn't out of anger, you know, why did he do it? The answer may be, it just may be, and we'll talk about this at the end, that for official reasons, they just wanted to obliterate all traces of Hatshepsut. Maybe they didn't want it known in the official records that a woman had been king of Egypt. But we'll see. But there's another figure we have to talk about in this story of Hatshepsut. A man. His name is Senmut. Senmut. Now, Hatshepsut can't remarry. Women, queens, when their husbands died, did not remarry. It's, it's kind of like um, queens of England. I don't think they remarry either when they're widowed. I don't think so. Um, they just didn't do it. So she can't remarry. She is going to remain the widowed queen, so to speak, but then she becomes king. She does have her daughter, remember, Neferu Re. She has a daughter. But the daughter dies when she's a teenager. It must have been one of the great sadnesses in Hatshepsut's life. Neferu Re dies. But there is a man in her life. And we're really not sure exactly how much in her life he is, but many people have suggested that this Senmut is her lover. And I'll explain why. It's interesting, by the way, whenever you see little drawings of Senmut, you can always tell him he has kind of like a double chin. They draw him in with a double chin, uh, little lines under his chin. And I think it suggests prosperity. He's a little bit heavy, and that was good in Egypt. You could afford to eat. You were a little bit prosperous. Now, the reason people suggest Senmut was her lover, is that he had so many titles. He was so successful in her reign. First of all, he's a commoner. No royal blood in his veins. He is also a bachelor for life. We don't know of a wife, children, no family. Unusual in Egypt. He remained a bachelor for life. But his titles are important. He was overseer of the royal palace. That's one title. He was also the royal tutor. He was the daughter's tutor. And there are statues of Senmut with the girl on his lap, showing the, that he's the tutor. He also is overseer of the granaries of Amun. Now, remember, the temples had an awful lot of land. And as overseer of the granaries of Amun, he controlled a lot of money. A lot. He is also overseer of the works. He is in charge of things like building Deir el-Bahari, make sure where the money is dispersed. He has, he himself has two tombs. Senmut has two tombs. The first tomb is on the west bank of Thebes, high up, rather grand, rather grand, beautiful view. And when you walk through it, there on the walls are all his titles. Overseer of the palace, overseer of the granaries, royal tutor. And in this tomb, he never used it, by the way. The tomb was not used by Senmut. I'll tell you why in a minute. In this tomb were found the remains of his sarcophagus, a pink Aswan granite sarcophagus. All that pink granite used by the Egyptians comes from those quarries at Aswan, just on the southern border of Egypt. And his sarcophagus, when it was found by excavators, had been smashed to pieces, practically no piece larger than your fist. Now, it wasn't just like it cracked and broke. It looks like it was vengeance. But they took the pieces, and as best they could, they reconstructed it. And it exists today, by the way, in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Senmut's sarcophagus is there in New York in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. They reconstructed it, and what they discovered was it was in the shape of a cartouche. It was a royal sarcophagus. Not only that, it had originally been intended for Hatshepsut. She had given him her royal sarcophagus to be buried in. That's one of the reasons why people suggest that perhaps, just perhaps, Senmut and Hatshepsut 
were lovers. There's no doubt they were very close. Let me say something about his second tomb. It's in a unique place. It is within the temple precincts of Deir el-Bahri, Hatshepsut's mortuary temple. His tomb, he was permitted to place his tomb within the boundaries of the royal mortuary temple, a, a tremendous honor. It's an unusual tomb, quite special, quite special. It has several levels. You go all the way down and down and down. It's, it's really quite something. And then it's unfinished. He must have died before it was completed. Unfinished. But it has something that at that time was absolutely unique in Egypt. Nobody had ever seen it before. On the ceiling of his burial, well, not even his burial chamber, before the burial chamber, on the ceiling is an astronomical ceiling. It shows the hours of the night and the constellations of the night sky, beautifully drawn, you know, and the decans. That's how they divided the night into hours. And it shows which stars were where. Rather beautiful. Nobody had ever done this, ever. It's going to be copied in the future because it was so beautiful, but you'll see it in the Valley of the Kings. Royalty will pick up this idea of an astronomical ceiling. Right? But Senmut died before that was completed. Now, one last suggestion about their possibly, possibly being lovers. It seems as if, it seems as if, even during Hatshepsut's reign, people were talking about them. Senma dies before Hatshepsut. He just disappears from history, dies. But while he was alive, people were talking. And we have graffiti of the workmen who worked on the West Bank of Thebes that suggest that they thought there was something going on between the two of them. And let me describe it to you. It's pornographic graffiti. In the heat of the day, during lunch, when the, when the, when the workmen would take a break and have their lunch, they would often take their lunch breaks in unfinished tombs, and there were plenty of them in the area, just to stay out of the sun. They would go inside, and some of these guys were artists. They were artists. And they would draw on the walls, you know, just kind of the way kids do nowadays. And there was one graffito. Let me describe it to you. You make of it what you want. It shows a woman. She's naked. Except for the royal cobra on her forehead. Right? She's wearing the crown of Egypt. And making love to her is a man wearing an overseer's cap, like the overseer of the works. Right? So you have this female pharaoh being made love to by an overseer. Now, clearly it probably was Senmut and Hatshepsut. So people were talking. Now, why was she permitted? What was the special deal about putting his tomb within the precincts of Deir el-Bahri? Why? Well, Hatshepsut's tomb, Hatshepsut's tomb, in the Valley of the Kings, the longest in the valley, angles towards Deir el-Bahri. And Hatshepsut's and Senmut's tomb angles towards her. It's almost as if they were both tunneling underground, one from Deir el-Bahri, the other two from the Valley of the Kings to meet in the middle so they could spend eternity together. And many people think this was intentional, that they were really planning on sort of spending eternity forever. You know, together. But, but they didn't. Senmut dies first, then Hatshepsut dies. And after she dies, as we know, Tutmosis III succeeds her. And after a period of about 20 years, starts to erase her name wherever he could find it. And as I say, I don't think it's done in anger. At some point, there was an official decision made. We can't have it recorded that a woman was king of Egypt. So today, if you look on the king's lists, these long lists that pharaohs carved on temple's walls of their ancestors, of the previous kings of Egypt, if you look on these king's lists, you will never find the name of Hatshepsut. Never. Egypt just couldn't have it recorded that they had a woman as king. 
but she was quite a king. I'll see you next time.